They're probably the most talked about, collected, obsessed over, hoarded, coveted, guarded, even fetishized kitchen tools. I'm talking, of course, about a chef's knife collection. Line cooks and chefs can be extremely territorial with their knives. Anthony Bourdain famously said in the legendary book Kitchen Confidential, don't touch my d don't touch my knife. And yes, some of us really are that serious. Hello again and welcome to Hospitable You and the introduction to culinary arts video series, Lesson 4, Kitchen Knives, Part 1, Styles and Functions. I'll be your host for this series, Chef Jack. <laughs> I mark all my western style knives with green electrical tape around the handle where it meets the bolster to help keep track of them in a crowded kitchen. Most of my Japanese knives have my name engraved on the blade by the knife maker. And two other Japanese knives in my collection are so unique I could spot them across the kitchen, even if I didn't sense them being removed from my bag. Most chefs have a bag, case, or roll they keep their tools organized in. That's really the operative word here. Tools. Just as an electrician has his tools, a painter has paintbrushes, a sculptor has his tools, a blacksmith, an illustrator, an electronics technician, they all have a specific set of tools that they rely on that they could not do their job without. Spatulas, measuring cups, ladles, tongs, graters, microplanes, whisks, slotted spoons, brushes, and disher scoops are the cook and chef's tools. And absolutely none of them hold as much fascination as knives do. Not even the beloved tongs. Or more recently, hipster tweezers and antique plating spoon. Just as Phillips head, hex wrenches, and channel locks have different functions in a toolbox, different kitchen knife blade styles, handles, and metal compositions have different functions in cooking. From the meager paring knife to the mighty magro bocho, every blade size and shape has a function and specialization, a task it was specifically designed to handle. From cutting garnishes to general purpose to taking apart a 400 pound tuna, here are some of the most common and most uncommon knife styles you can find in restaurant kitchens and what they were designed to do. Paring knife, often the smallest in the chef's knife kit. This blade is designed to cut small vegetables, garnishes, herbs, and do fine detail work. The blade is usually one and a half to three inches long and fairly regular in shape and outline. Cousin of the paring knife and sometimes even smaller. We have a hook bill or tournée knife. These are specifically designed to carve fruits and vegetables for ornate garnishes and sculpting. Designed for the dreaded and never really used in the real world. Tournée cut, taught in French and Western-based culinary schools. A technique ostensibly taught because the result allows various ingredients, cut in the same seven-sided football-shaped manner, to cook evenly and present attractively on the plate. There are less time-consuming, less wasteful, and just as attractive alternatives, so this technique has pretty much gone the way of the dinosaur in the real world. It's still taught, primarily to help teach discipline to culinary students and force them to build and practice their knife technique. Utility knife. A lot of knife sets come with something labeled like this. Usually with a six inch blade, depending on the manufacturer, this term is kind of a catch-all for blade styles and lengths and doesn't really have a definitive function, but could also have any function that you want them to. Sometimes a small version of the French knife, sometimes closely resembling a bread knife, or even just a large paring knife. I find they are generally too large for small detailed tasks and too small to be a workhorse knife. They can be useful, but mostly just collect dust in your knife kit. A boning knife, also known as a boner, Quiet back there. This knife is specifically designed to strip muscle away from bone and clean tendons, sinew, and silver skin from edible muscle tissue. They typically have a narrow, thin, medium length blade and can come in both flexible or stiff blade variants. All right, stop giggling. These variants allow a greater range of capabilities and are used for different tasks. The rigid blade is usually used for taking apart larger joints of meat, like legs and bone and rib loins of various animals while the flexible blade is used for cleaning loins for steaks and breaking down smaller animals like chicken, fish, and small game. Some chefs prefer one over the other, and it largely depends on the job being performed and the person performing it. A bread knife. As the name implies, this knife is primarily used for cutting bread. With a deeply serrated blade, these come in many different styles. The best, most functional bread knives have a blade that is large enough or offset from the handle that extends far enough toward the item being cut so that the blade hits the cutting board before your knuckles do. This may sound obvious, but many knife makers make bread knives with blades that extend directly out from the handle, leaving no clearance for fingers and making the task of cutting delicate, crumbly crust more awkward. Ideally, the serrations should be wide and deep and the blade should be thin. Serrations too close together on a thick blade makes the crust of the bread turn into breadcrumbs in your hand. Not the desired effect at all. You want to keep the crust as intact as possible so the guests experience the full range of textures your baker intended. So don't disrespect the baker. Use the right knife. French knife or chef's knife. The single most versatile blade in a western kitchen arsenal, 
maybe even any kitchen. With a wide blade, finely pointed tip, heavy spine, straight blade, and thin cutting edge arching down to the tip, the French knife is designed for a multitude of uses. The fine tip can be used to cut garnishes, the straightness of the blade and the heavy spine make chopping easy, the length of the blade makes it an effective slicer, the arched edge allows for faster and safer movements through tasks with a rocking action employed so the arch never leaves the cutting board, and the width and weight allows it to function as a light cleaver and utility bench scraper. This is the only knife a home cook really needs, and a knife every culinarian should possess. Though there are some Chinese chefs that exclusively use their cleavers and can do with them anything that any other chef can do, the French knife is much easier to master and wield. It is the centerpiece of most knife collections. I have three of varying sizes. Some sushi chefs even prefer this knife design to more traditional Japanese blades specifically designed to cut fish. Slicers. Just as long and sometimes longer than the French knife, slicers are designed to carve cooked meats like roasts and large poultry and can also be used pretty effectively to butcher fish sometimes with hollow ground blades that have regular divots ground out of the blade at intervals along its length. These are designed to allow the thin blade to glide more easily through a thick and juicy roast. They can have either bluntly rounded or sharply pointed tips and usually have a cutting edge that is parallel with the spine for almost the entire length of the narrow blade. This allows for less contact with the meat being cut and therefore less friction in a smoother cut. They rely on long, even strokes to do their job most effectively. Hey, what I say about giggling? Beware of a sawing motion as it will leave a jagged cut surface. In some applications this is desirable, in some it's not, and some it doesn't matter either way. Those distinctions will largely depend on the setting, type of cuisine, and the pet peeves of the chef. Cleavers, butcher knives, and scimitars. Highly specialized to butcher shops, these knives aren't used in modern restaurant kitchens all that often, but it's worth getting to know them. Cleavers are large, blocky, usually very heavy blades, with a thick blade and overly broad cutting angle, in order to get through bone without chipping the blade. These are brute force tools in most cases. Butcher knives are used to take apart extremely large joints of meat, like whole steer legs, though a stiff boning knife helps here too. The blade is designed for long, sustained strokes running the length of the large loin. Also sometimes used for butchering large fish like salmon and halibut, though the scimitar or even a large French knife is much more common. As mentioned, the scimitar, also sometimes called the scimitar, is a long, broad, curved bladed knife mostly used for butchering large fish and meats. It is fairly interchangeable with the butcher's knife and more commonly seen in restaurant kitchens than the other two we mentioned. While most kitchens might have a cleaver handy, it doesn't typically get used that much, and usually ends up knocking around in a drawer somewhere, getting dull and rusty. Unless, of course, you work in a Chinese or Southeast Asian kitchen. While we're on the subject, Chinese cleaver. Some Chinese chefs only really use one knife for every task. This wide and heavy cleaver. Though thinner and lighter than a typical Western cleaver, it is sometimes even wider, with a blocky, almost perfectly rectangular blade and nearly straight cutting edge. I've seen Chinese chefs cut garnishes with these, butcher small fish and chickens, and even do decorative cuts. The legendary Martin Yan of the popular 80s cooking show Yan Can Cook would stare grinningly at the camera without looking at his hands, while he used a Chinese cleaver to cut things like cucumbers into paper-thin and extremely uniform slices faster than the camera could catch his movement. Yan shows that with enough practice and determination, and probably some necessity, you can learn to make any tool do what you need it to do. Now we get into the highly specialized area of Japanese cutlery. We will only be talking about the most common types here, so for a more detailed analysis, check the book links in the description. Specifically the book, Japanese Kitchen Knives, Essential Techniques and Recipes. Extremely detailed, it walks you through each knife design and gives you recipes to utilize them. The Deba is usually the heaviest knife in a Japanese chef's arsenal, meant to be heavy and sturdy enough to cut through the smaller bones of fish and poultry, and with a blade designed to lift fillets off of these small frames. And they have a broader cutting angle than most Japanese blades to help prevent chipping while they do so. It has a broad curved blade that is much thicker at the spine than the other knives we've discussed, sometimes even more than a western cleaver, and typically much shorter. There are a few types of Deba including the Kodeba, a very small version used for cutting small fish and garnishes, the Miyoroshi Deba, a longer, narrow-bladed variant closely resembling a French knife and used for filleting, and the shorter standard Deba. Even though these knives have a similarly curved blade to the French knife, it should be mentioned that they are not designed to be used with the same rocking technique employed with a French knife. If you have an authentic Deba with a carbon steel edge, using it in this way will chip and torque your edge that will not only take you hours over a whetstone to work out, but possibly shred it as well. Don't do this with any Japanese blade. You've been warned. Yanagiba. This is the knife of the sushi chef. A long, narrow blade with a cutting edge parallel to the spine for most of its length. 
designed to take slices off of fish fillets with one smooth stroke, utilizing the length of the blade. Here's where that sawing action mentioned before should be avoided at all cost, as it will produce a jagged cut surface and not present well as sashimi. There is a specific technique to purposefully produce a jagged, even zigzag edge that is almost exclusively used with taco. For a chef of the Japanese traditions, this might be their most used knife, certainly for sushi chefs. Some yanagiba are shaped like miniature samurai swords, and some have flat tips, the next group of knives we will be discussing. The flat-ended variety, called the takobiki, is mainly used for cutting octopus. Usuba or nakiri, referred to a finely edged knife used for cutting vegetables. The deba has a blade that is much too thick and can damage or crush delicate vegetables, so this knife is used. It has the finest and most delicate edge of all the Japanese knife varieties and comes in two main blade styles. The flat, boxy ended kanto style, a term referring to eastern Japan centering around Tokyo, and the kansai style, a term referring to western Japan centering around the Osaka and Kyoto region. The kansai style features a spine that curves dramatically downward toward the tip. Looking like miniature cleavers, they are meant to be used in a similar fashion, though not nearly as forcefully. Also, do not rock these blades either. The edges on these knives are extremely easy to chip because they are so fine in order to get the most precise cuts without damaging the item being cut. The cutting edge is typically parallel with the spine all the way to the flat end of the blade. Unagisaki and Sobagiri. These are extremely specialized knives for cutting unagi, freshwater eel, and cutting soba, buckwheat noodles. The dramatic angle of the Kanto-style unagisaki looks like something out of a video game, and the sobagiri looks like a giant cleaver that wraps around your hand, much like something a video game villain might carry. They are both strikingly dramatic visually and highly specific to certain tasks. Most Japanese knives can be bought with a saya, a wooden sleeve held in place with a wooden pin when the knife is not in use. They are usually shaped like the silhouette of the blade and meant to protect the delicate edges of these knives from being damaged in storage. This next Japanese knife needs a sheath more than a saya, however. The Magrobocho, the most dramatic of all the Japanese kitchen knives, and maybe all kitchen knives. This blade is made to take apart large 400 to 500 pound fish like the bluefin tuna. The name literally translates to tuna knife. And again, like something out of a video game, it looks like a huge version of a samurai sword. It is usually operated by two people, and the giant, thick, heavy blade is made to go through tuna, bones and all. There are a multitude of videos on YouTube of fish butchers at Tsukiji Market in central Tokyo using these knives with astounding efficiency and accuracy considering the sheer size. Now that we've talked about some of the more popular styles of kitchen knives, I think we need to point out the differences here. Western knives and Chinese cleavers have similar edge design. That is to say, they have, ideally, a single bevel on each side of the blade that leads down to the cutting edge. There are knives with double beveled edges, but these knives should be avoided, unless it's for a western style cleaver, which we've already discussed, tends to end up being more of a cudgel than a blade. This blade design makes it difficult to maintain the knife for any real longevity, due to the fact that they are usually cheaply made, with soft metal that needs to be sharpened more often. The more you have to sharpen these blades, the more difficult it becomes to sharpen them, due to the poor design, until it essentially becomes a straight bevel anyway, if you haven't thrown it out by that point. Regardless, the important takeaway here is edge angles. Western knives have a sharpened edge on both sides, and the angle of that edge greatly impacts the effectiveness of the knife's performance. Basically, the wider the angle, the tougher and more chip-resistant the edge will be, but it won't slice a tomato very well. On the other hand, a knife with an extremely narrow edge will make slicing a dream, but chopping anything on a cutting board will chip or roll the edge as fast as trying to saw through a crowbar. The solution is knowing what each blade design is best at. French knives and general purpose knives are best maintained with slightly wider angles than slicers and boning knives. Knives that you want to glide through ingredients without damaging them like meats and fish, but have very little cutting board contact can and should be sharpened to a finer edge angle, or included angle. Japanese blades only have one side that is sharpened, and the entire surface on that side is ground down, making it possible to get the edge much finer than other blade styles. It should also be noted that most Japanese knives do not come sharpened. You have to put the first edge on the knife. While this may seem intimidating to first-time owners of these blade styles, it is really a great opportunity to learn how to sharpen these knives through a long and repetitive process to get that motion ingrained in your muscle memory. It also allows you to get used to handling your new knife and learn how it feels in your hand. Eventually, you will become so intimately familiar with your favorite knife that it will start to feel like an extension of your arm. We'll get deeper into the various metal types, blade edge designs, and sharpening strategies in the next lesson. Now it's time for... Focus, Focus on, on food, food safety. safety. Here we want to show the safest way to clean and sanitize knives and sharp objects. You really just need to be careful and follow some simple tricks. First, get a sponge nice and lathered up. If your knife really needs a good scrubbing, then use a green scrubby. But never use a steel wool unless you actually want to destroy the finish on the blade. 
your call, I guess. Once you have your sponge or scrubby all lathered up, place the blade of the knife flat against the side of the sink. Scrub out and down, never up against the blade. This will prevent you from cutting yourself or shredding the sponge. Turn the knife around or use the other side of the sink to get the other surface. Then rinse the blade well. Next, using a pinch grip, firmly hold onto the base of the blade just beyond the bolster and scrub the handle. Rinse well, dry carefully, always moving from the heel to the tip along the spine or wiping from the spine down over the edge. Once you have a good feel for the weight and shape of your knife, this will become easier. Use the same technique to dry the handle that you use to scrub it. Once the blade and handle are dry, dunk the whole thing into a sanitizer solution. Quat Sani solution is meant to air dry to be the most effective. If you have a carbon steel blade, like most Japanese knives, you might want to dry it anyway or it will start to rust. Today we talked about the most important part of the chef's toolkit, knives. The various styles and functions, blade designs, and what each is best at. We looked at some of the differences between French and European styles and the Eastern styles of China and Japan. In our Focus on Food Safety segment, we talked about safely cleaning and sanitizing sharp objects. In the next video, we will be discussing various metal compositions used in knife making and the major differences between the two most popular knife making countries, Germany and Japan. We will examine how to sharpen these knives and talk about sharpening strategies to match the function of that particular blade style based on what they are primarily used for to get the most efficiency out of your knives. So we'll see you next time. Hospitable U is produced by Hospitable Productions LLC and all of the people listed here. If you want to help keep Hospitable U free for everyone, please consider donating to our PayPal or become a patron on Patreon. Thank you for watching and thank you for helping us create a more hospitable U.